optometrist talking to a patient called Marcia Samarina. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. Now, Jane, just before we begin, can I start by asking you your age? Uh, I'm 25. Okay. And what brings you in today, Jane? What's the problem? Um, well, I've been feeling a bit tired for the past few weeks, and I don't seem to have much energy to do anything, really. And I was wondering if you could tell me what's wrong with me. Okay. Um, well, tell me a little bit more about it. Um, well, I started to get tired about four weeks ago, and it's really yes. persisted since that time. Um, and I've actually had to stop playing netball because I've, I've been so tired. Um, when it started off, I had some aches and pains in my muscles, and um, but they seem to have settled down now, and it's really just the, the tiredness that's persisting. And um, I've got exams in a few weeks, and I'm really worried that I won't be able to study properly because I'm feeling so tired. I see. Goodness, that must be very distressing for you. Yeah, it's really worrying me. Yeah. What uh, What are you studying? I'm a social work student. I see. Well, tell me, um, apart from the aches and pains that you noticed initially with this illness, was there anything else in particular that you'd noticed? Um, well, it sort of started quite suddenly, really, and, and when it started, I had a bit of a cold, um, you know, a bit yes. of a blocked up head and a runny nose. Um, and I actually went to the doctor at student health at the university yes. and he said I just had a virus and I didn't need any treatment and it would go away. Um, and he didn't do anything else than that really. Right, okay. So at the moment, just to let me clarify again, the main problem now is tiredness. All of the other symptoms have, have settled down. Um, yeah, just really tired and I can't do anything really. Right, okay. Well, just before I actually start examining you, can I ask you a few just general questions before we get started, okay? Mm -hmm. um, what's your appetite and weight been like? Um, my appetite's been fine. I've been eating the same amount and my weight's steady. Okay. And have you been running any fevers recently? No, no. Um, four weeks ago when I had a bit of a cold, I thought I had a bit of a temperature then, um, but nothing now. Mm, okay. And um, your bowel habits? I've been regular. Regular, that's good. All right, well, look, I think um, at this stage I'd like to have a bit of a look at you and um, we'll talk about um, things after that, okay? All right. All right. Right, Jane. Having had a look at you, I think really the major things that, uh, that are noticeable are that you've, you've uh, got some scattered glands around your body, okay, those lumps that I felt um, in the neck, armpits and down in the groin regions and you may have also noticed a bit of discomfort up in the left side of your abdomen high up when I was feeling mm -hmm. and yes. that, um, that is the site of, a, of an organ called the spleen which is also a, a type of gland which is also enlarged, okay. Mm -hmm. So what does I, that think, mean? I think all of these really point to some form of viral illness, quite possibly um, glandular fever. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask as well, are you absolutely sure it's glandular fever? Mm. It's highly suggestive, okay. I can't be totally certain um, at this stage without really doing um, some tests to confirm it, and I think that would be a good idea to do. What sort of tests are they? It's a blood test and it will involve a small sample of blood being taken. Really what I'll do is do a specific test for glandular fever as well as looking at your blood in general to make sure that there are no other possible problems there. And that can tell for sure if it's glandular fever? Uh, it, yes, that's correct. Right. Um, and when you do the blood test, can you see if I'm anemic as well? 
Yes, certainly. Is that a particular concern of yours? Yeah, well, I've been having all those ads on the TV, you know, about if you don't eat enough meat, then you might be anemic, especially if you're tired. And I was wondering if that was my problem as well. Okay, I mean, tiredness certainly can be uh, one of the symptoms of anemia, and I think it's justified that you're concerned about it, particularly given the, the publicity that we've been having, but... Um, I can fairly confidently reassure you just on having examined you that that would be very unlikely in your case. Okay, But we can certainly uh, run that test and in fact I was going to run that test as a routine anyway. Oh, oh that's good. Oh. Right. What you need to do really at this stage is rest. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there are no specific remedies that I can give you for this illness. Um, we can't cure it. Your own body will cure it by, by fighting it off, but that will take a bit of time. Um, how long exactly? Again, I can't, I can't be certain. Hopefully within the next week or two you'll be feeling a lot better, but that's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. Um, at home, really, um, you need to keep up your diet and keep up your fluid intake and really we're going to have to organise to meet again and just make sure that this is slowly settling with time. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. James Williams. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, he's my father, and he had a septic shock. And when we consulted locally, the diagnosis revealed elevated cardiac enzyme profile. He had some workup done from cardiac standpoint, which has been negative so far. Okay. Does he have any previous history of chest pain or shortness of breath? No, doctor. What is his name and age? His name is James Williams, and he's 58 years old, doctor. Does he have any history of hypertension or diabetes mellitus? No, doctor. Does he smoke or drink? No, doctor. May I know his past medical history? Well, he had pulmonary fibrosis, and he is on prednisone, oxygen-dependent cellulitis, status post-foot surgery with infection, recuperating from the same, respiratory acidosis, septicemia, and septic shock, presently on mechanical ventilation, no prior cardiac history, elevated cardiac enzyme profile. He had any surgery earlier? Yes, he had foot surgery. Okay. What medicines he is taking now? Vitamin supplementation, prednisone, cyclobenzaprine, losartan, 50 mg daily, nifedipine, 90 mg daily, Lasix, potassium supplementation. Is he allergic to any medicine? Yes, he's allergic to sulfa. Well, his physical examination reports show pulse rate of 94, blood pressure of 98 over 57, Respiratory rate as normal. Air entry bilaterally clear. Rails are scattered. Point of maximal impulse displaced. 
S1, S2, regular. Systolic murmur, grade 2 of 6. There are chronic skin changes, markings in the lower extremities. Pulses found palpable. His laboratory reports show echocardiogram is normal. Sinus rhythm with wide complex. White blood count of 20,000, hemoglobin 10, and hematocrit 33. Platelets of 163. International normalized ratio 1.36. BUN of 158. Creatinine 8.7. Potassium 7.3 of bicarbonate is 11. Cardiac enzyme profile troponin 0 0.05. Total creatine kinase 312. Myoglobin 1423. Chest x-ray, no acute changes. He has pulmonary fibrosis and is on prednisone. Oxygen dependent with respiratory acidosis. Septicemia, septic shock secondary to cellulitis of the leg. Acute renal shutdown. Elevated cardiac enzyme profile without prior cardiac history, possibly due to sepsis and also acute renal failure. I am ordering an echocardiogram to assess left ventricle function to rule out any cardiac valvular involvement. He needs aggressive medical management, including dialysis. From a cardiac standpoint, conservative treatment at this juncture. His cardiac enzyme profile could be elevated secondary to sepsis and also underlying renal failure. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at question 25. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about spastic cerebral palsy and its classifications. Hello, doctor. What is spastic cerebral palsy and how is it classified? Well, spastic cerebral palsy is the common type of cerebral palsy that also accompanies nearly a third of other types of cerebral palsy. The damage is in the corticospinal tract or the motor cortex. This part affects the areas that receive gamma aminobutyric acid that is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Spastic cerebral palsy is further divided into types according to the areas of the body that it affects. In spastic diplegia, the lower limbs are affected with little to no upper body spasticity. Most people with spastic diplegia are fully ambulatory and have a scissors gait. They may also have other problems like hip problems, dislocations, crossed eyes, or strabismus. In spastic hemiplegia, one side of the body is affected, which occurs when injury occurs to muscle nerves controlled by the left side of the brain, will cause a right body deficit and when injury occurs to muscle nerves controlled by the right side of brain will cause a left body deficit, vice versa. In spastic tetraplegia, all four limbs affected equally. These patients are least likely to be able to walk because their muscles are too tight, and they may also develop an uncontrollable shaking that affects the limbs on one side of the body that impairs normal movement. Question 26. You hear a discussion about different dose rates of brachiotherapy.
Hello, doctor. What are different dose rates of brachytherapy? Well, brachytherapy is a form of localized radiation therapy involving the direct placement of radioactive material close to or inside a tumor. Brachytherapy varies by dose, mode of delivery, and the location of the cancer. High dose rate brachytherapy is given over periods of 10 to 20 minutes. The radiation dose is delivered as a short burst using a remote after loading machine. Low dose rate brachytherapy is administered at a continuous rate in sessions that can last up to 50 hours. In the pulsed dose rate brachytherapy, the radiation is usually delivered once every hour rather than continuously. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about bariatric surgery. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of bariatric surgery? Well, there are four different types of surgeries offered to patients. The main principle of adjustable gastric banding is to decrease food intake with the use of a small bracelet-like band placed around the top of the stomach. The band restricts the size of the opening from the throat to the stomach, limiting the amount of food a patient can ingest. The size of the opening can be modified using a balloon inside the band that can be inflated or deflated with saline solution according to the needs of the patient. Biliopancreatic diversion with a duodenal switch, also known as the duodenal switch, is a three-stage procedure that involves the removal of a large part of the stomach, which makes the patient feel full after eating only a small meal, followed by rerouting of the small intestines to prevent food absorption. The third step involves changing how bile and other digestive juices affect the process of digesting and absorbing calories. Ruin Y gastric bypass method is also used to decrease food intake and involves creating a small pouch. The food bypasses the rest of the stomach and reaches the small intestine, where it is absorbed to a much lesser degree than if it had passed through the stomach, duodenum, and upper intestine. Vertical sleeve gastrectomy procedure involves removal of most of the stomach which not only restricts food intake and absorption, but lowers the levels of the hormone ghrelin that is responsible for appetite. Question 28. You hear a discussion about oral lichen planus lesions. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of oral lichen planus lesions? Well, oral lichen planus lesions may belong to one of the following six types. Reticular is the common and usually asymptomatic that presents with a fine network of white lines called Wickham's striae, which are symmetrical and found on both sides of the mouth, usually over the buccal mucous membrane. Erosive consists of irregular painful ulcers covered by a yellowish pseudomembrane of fibrin, with the white striae all around the lesions. Atrophic is usually found as an ulcer covered by fibrinous exudate on an erythematous background. Bolus is the rarest type that is characterized by small or large vesicles, or bully, which break open, leaving a painful ulcer. Papular is an uncommon type, consisting of tiny raised white spots with the characteristic white striae at the periphery. The plaque lesions appear as smooth to slightly roughened whitish patches, rather like leukoplakia, found over the tongue and the inside of the cheeks. Question 29. You hear a lecture about the autoimmune diseases that affect the blood and blood vessels. What are the autoimmune diseases that affect the blood and blood vessels? 
Well, polyarteritis nodosa is a severe autoimmune disease affecting the small and medium-sized arteries that become inflamed and damaged. Idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura causes damage to the blood platelets that are essential to formation of blood clots. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome leading to damage to blood vessels. Hemolytic anemia is caused when the immunological cells damage the blood cells. Question 30. You hear a discussion about different types of biosensing elements. Hello, doctor. What are biosensing elements? Well, an enzyme is a protein that has a high selectivity for a particular substrate, which it binds to, bringing about a catalytic change. Enzymes are commercially available in highly purified states and are therefore useful in the mass production of enzyme sensors. Enzymes can be fixed onto the surface of a transducer through absorption, covalent attachment, and entrapment in a gel or an electrochemically generated polymer. Antibodies, or immunosensors, are produced by B lymphocytes in response to antigenic stimuli such as foreign invaders or microbes. When used as biosensors and immunoassays, antibodies are immobilized on the surface of a transducer through covalent attachment by conjugation of amino, carboxyl, aldehyde, or sulfhydryl groups. Antibodies are sensitive to changes in potential hydrogen, ionic strength, chemical inhibitors, and temperature. Immune sensors usually employ optical, fluorescence, or acoustic transducers. Microorganisms or microbes may be used to detect the consumption of oxygen or carbon dioxide in an environment using electrochemical techniques. Microbiosensors have the advantage of being cheaper than enzymes or antibodies and are more stable. However, they may be less selective than enzymes or antibodies. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
And today I'm going to be giving you a broad overview about the incidence of congenital heart disease uh, in Australian newborns. Certainly we know that if the mother has congenital heart disease, then her children are more likely to have congenital heart disease. We know that the older a mother gets, that this places her at risk of having a baby who has congenital heart disease. We know that if mum has diabetes early in pregnancy, and particularly um, uncontrolled diabetes very early on in pregnancy, that this places the baby at risk of having congenital heart disease. In pregnancy, we screen women for rubella, for cytomegalovirus, for herpes simplex virus and for Coxsackie B virus because we know that these viral infections are all associated with congenital heart disease. So you would think that um, we probably diagnose congenital heart disease quite well antenatally and we certainly know that for instance in Queensland in the most recent statistics uh, that 99.7% of pregnant women have an obstetric ultrasound. If we compare this to Victoria, we know that in Victoria around 95% of women have an antenatal ultrasound at 18 weeks. What might come as a surprise to people is that despite uh, our excellent techniques in ultrasonography, that in fact only around 53% of quite significant congenital heart disease is detected. And to put this into um, perspective for you, if we look at the number of babies that the Newborn Emergency Transport Service tra uh, retrieve every year with congenital heart disease, we know that around 20% of the babies that we retrieve will be born in a level one hospital. It has very limited diagnostic facilities, so may or may not be able to do uh, a blood gas, uh, usually cannot do a cardiac echo postnatally, um, and therefore uh, in these places um, the staff have very limited facilities to deal with a baby who's born who can be really quite ill. Around a quarter of the babies that NETS retrieve will be born in a level two hospital. But these hospitals again are unable to maintain a baby who needs full life support or who needs intubation and ventilation. So these babies have to be retrieved. So we see that on average around 45% of babies who are born with very significant congenital heart disease are born outside of a tertiary centre. One of the questions we get asked quite often is that why don't these problems present in utero? Why is it that the baby grows quite normally, uh, is a good size, the mother gets to term, goes into spontaneous preterm labour, and it's only after the baby's born that we start to see problems? We certainly know that this is uh, because of fetal circulation. So during fetal life, the placenta is doing the work of oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal, and the baby really contributes very, very little to its day-to-day -day survival, probably only about 8%, because the placenta is oxygenating the blood and therefore the lungs are not acting as an organ of oxygenation. Now, of course, when the baby's born, the baby has to undergo very dramatic physiological and biochemical changes to shift from fetal circulation to an adult type of circulation. And therefore, if the baby has congenital heart disease, this is the time period that we're going to suddenly see it. Now, contrary to uh, what people have traditionally thought, the ductus arteriosus uh, does not necessarily close with the first breaths of life. And in fact, we know from ultrasound studies that only about 20% of babies' ducts are closed by 24 hours of age, around 82% by 48 hours, and in some babies, uh, it takes up to three days for the ductus arteriosus to close completely. And this becomes important when we are thinking about the baby who has congenital heart disease because uh, the timing of the closure of the duct can affect the timing of presentation of the baby uh, to us. So we would expect that by three days of age that most babies' ducts will close. So what happens if the baby has congenital heart disease? How are we going to know it and when are we going to see these babies present with it? Well, basically, it all depends upon what the defect uh, affects. So if the defect uh, obstructs normal circulation, then we're going to see symptoms very, very early in the newborn period, basically in the period between the time the baby's born and the time that the ductus arteriosus closes. So conditions like transposition of the great arteries will present very, very early within the few, first few hours of the baby being born. As opposed to some of the other conditions which uh, appear as anatomical changes occur, such as the duct closing um, after three days of age, so this would be um, conditions such as coarctation of the aorta. And this can typically present around day seven or day um, up to day 10 of life, and typically after the baby has in fact gone home. So this might be picked up by the parents who notice that the baby is mottled, his uh, 
feeding poorly, um, seems cool to touch peripherally, um, is very, very tired and lethargic between feeds and seems to be breathing up uh, quite markedly. So how are we going to make a definitive diagnosis of congenital heart disease and especially out in a small hospital or a, a GP surgery where they may not have um, gold standard tools? We certainly know that the gold standard for diagnosing congenital heart disease is ECHO by a paediatric cardiologist after birth. But these facilities are really only available at the major tertiary teaching hospitals such as the Royal Children's. And so until a cardiac echo can be performed, we really have to rely on our clinical signs to try and differentiate congenital heart disease from some of the other causes of cyanosis and collapse in the newborn period. And this can be really quite challenging. Here on the health report, we cover all sorts of search. The Mediterranean diet, what fat is right for you, how much salt is safe, diets to protect you from diabetes, early death, heart disease. So this next segment is actually a bit perturbing. We've been told that almost all this research is wrong. Yes, John Ioannidis is professor of medicine at Stanford University, and he says the scientific approach taken by nutritional researchers is nowhere near rigorous enough, and we have to go back to basics if we're to learn anything significant about how diets impact health. Thank you for inviting me. Now, we've had you on lots of times before, talking about various things and uh, demolishing a few iconic areas of health and research. You're arguing that nutritional research needs radical reform. On what basis do you say that? Well, th there's clearly a factory of papers being produced in uh, nutrition uh, epidemiology in particular that don't meet very high standards of credibility. The type of research that is being done in nutritional epidemiology, it's not an issue that there's bad scientists involved in it. You know, maybe excellent scientists are involved in it, but the odds of getting it right are extremely small. Let's look at that in a moment, but you quote in your paper some really bizarre conclusions that you might come to from, uh, if you have believed, past nutritional research. Do you want to just tell us some of those bizarre findings in the, the relation to either longevity or shortened lifespan? Most of these studies are not experimental. They're not randomized. They're just uh, observing people who report what they eat, and they take that seriously that this is reflecting exactly what they ate, which is one major assumption. Second, people take 
these behaviors and these numbers as causal, which means that they look at the numbers and they translate them to an effect of these nutrients or of these foods on mortality. And then they also make a, another assumption that uh, these risks are applicable to the entire lifespan. So then, uh, let's take a number like 15% uh, relative risk reduction in mortality or 15% increase in survival, which is a typical number that comes out of these studies. And this is uh, the number that is the summary of all the data, for example, on what is the benefit with eating 12 hazelnuts a day. Uh, if you translate that to a gain in uh, survival, you take 80 years, you multiply that by 15%. This looks like a 12-year gain in survival just by eating 12 hazelnuts a day, or, or literally one hazelnut a day would give you one more year of life uh, as a benefit. It's a ridiculous calculation. It is not so, of course. Even if you believe that one of these foods or one of these nutrients or a couple of them may be important, it's impossible to believe that every single food, every single nutrient will have such tremendous benefits or such tremendous risks. So you, you get there because of there's multiple levels of unreliability, is that what it is? That essentially the food diary is unreliable, they're not controlling for other factors such as education and other environmental factors properly and they all conflate together to give you bizarre results, is that what's going on? Exactly. It's a, it's a problem at multiple levels. It's an extremely difficult field to study. And it doesn't mean that observational studies, that epidemiological studies, get it wrong all the time. In many other fields, the problems are much more straightforward. For example, we know for sure that smoking is killing zillions of people. It will kill one billion people in the next century unless we do something. But the, the effect uh, of smoking is huge. Uh, the, the risk increases 20-fold if uh, someone is smoking for getting lung cancer. But just to that. challenge you on that, whilst we're confident in smoking, why are we confident in smoking and not in coffee? Because there have been no randomized controlled trials of getting people to smoke and other people not to smoke. I mean, so that's still on observational studies, is it not? The major difference with smoking is that the, uh, the effect is tremendous. Uh, we're talking, as I said, of a 20-fold increase in risk of lung cancer, 10-fold increase in cardiovascular disease. Uh, many other diseases have tremendous increase in risk. For each single nutrient, each single uh, thing that we eat or drink, the effects, even if you take these studies literally, are much, much, much smaller. And based on what we know from some randomized trials that we have done, the effects are pretty much close to null, if not exactly null. I mean, it's very likely that they're exactly null, which means that it's a complete waste to even try to pursue them any further. What about we cannot really use epidemiology to study a relative risk of 1.01. .01. We can do it to study a relative risk of 20, which is what's the case for smoking. And just to dissect that out for a non, people who don't know the statistics, is that 1.01 .01 is, there's no effect, 1.01 .01 is just tiny, whereas 20, an effect of 20 is 20 times the risk. So 1.01 .01 is just a little bit over what would be normal and probably within normal limits. So uh, what about eating patterns? I mean, you yourself have been involved in trials of the Mediterranean diet. So I think that eating patterns in theory might be able to get you a little bit of that complexity of all these nutrients interacting together. But even those are very difficult, if not impossible, to study within an observational context. Again, you have most of these problems operating. Number one, you need to ask people what type of eating pattern they're following, and you know responses may be accurate or very often may be very inaccurate, especially if you try to recall what you ate and tell what you're doing, just try it to yourself and, <laughs> and, and see whether that information would be reliable. The second problem is that you still have extreme complexity among all these nutrients. We, we have over 200,000 different foods that you can combine in different ways. There's no clear eating pattern that each one of us is following. We follow different eating patterns in different periods of our lives and different days even, and it also changes all the time. If you superimpose the way that we react to all of these uh, chemicals that we digest, our metabolic profile, also our genetic profile might affect how we react. Circumstances, uh, our environment, socioeconomic factors that dictate what we decide to eat or not eat, 
and what we do or don't do with our life at the same time, it's an extremely complex system. 